Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my channel, Kalanadi. Today I am going to talk about the 76th World Science Fiction Convention that I attended this last week in San Jose, California. So this video is going to be quite a ramble about all the stuff that I saw and did and acquired at the convention. Um, if you are here for the book haul, that will be in a separate video because yes, I bought a bunch of books and they deserve their own video and that will be out uh, pretty shortly after this video is. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about what Worldcon is. If you haven't heard of it, you can Google it. There's a lot of information about it. But in a really short form, it is a convention for um, fans, readers, authors, artists, other creators. Um, it's basically SFF fandom oriented, and it is where the Hugo Awards are handed out. The convention kind of culminates in the big Hugo Awards ceremony, and the Hugo Awards are administered by each year's Worldcon. So this is my second Worldcon that I've gone to. I went to Mid-Americon 2 when it was in Kansas City in 2016. I did not make it to last year's Worldcon when it was in Helsinki, Finland which I deeply regret in so many ways. I had a serious case of FOMO, you guys. Um, so after I missed Helsinki, I basically vowed that I would go to every single world con that I could feasibly attend um, because it's a lot of fun and it's how I see uh, and meet for the first time many of my online friends. And that is probably the first thing that I want to talk about this world con experience. Actually, I'm gonna begin with travel anxiety. Um, so going to San Jose was a big deal for me because I had to fly and I had to go alone. So I have traveled before, I've just never really done it alone. And this was the first time in my life that I've been that far away from home on by myself, you know, not without family members or my parents or something. So I was really anxious about that, especially the bit about navigating airports. I had flown before, but that was a couple of years ago and I didn't have to do anything. I just followed my family around and did what they told me to do. Uh, so I didn't really remember anything or the procedures and I was getting really anxious about that. Um, it turns out it's not that big of a deal. Um, my home airport where I fly out of is the worst because it has a terrible, terrible layout. But that's the only time where I went to the wrong place. I followed the signs that said, go to this gate. Only it turned out I was supposed to go the opposite direction from what the signs said, and that was really... <laughs> Everything else was great. I was really happy that um, getting through the airports and finding my gates and lining up in time and everything was actually really straightforward. And I think I'm, I'm in a much better mental state about traveling to Worldcon when it's in Dublin next year. Uh, but one of the things that made traveling and, and like getting around in San Jose so much easier is because of Paul. <laughs> um, Paul from A Common Touch of Fantasy is one of my friends who I met there for the first time and I just want to give him like a really huge shout out for waiting for me at the airport and helping me find my baggage and he handled you know getting an uber to and from the airports and figuring out the light rail system in san jose and these are all things that i was seriously freaking out about and he was just like there and super reliable and that helps so much with you know decreasing the stress and, and the anxiety of all of that and, and figuring it all out so paul is a large part of why i enjoyed this whole vacation from beginning to end without worrying about some stuff too much so i think that's a good segue into talking about the people that i met at worldcon because let's be honest that's kind of the best part <laughs> i've heard for a long time that like long time convention goers it, conventions are nice but it isn't so much about like the panels and the events it's more that you go to conventions to meet up with your friends who you only ever see at conventions it's like the big social event of the year i definitely understand that now because even though it's only my second world con what i was most looking forward to was meeting people and what was the most enjoyable part was just doing things with people that I already knew, that I already got along with, and just sort of like 
was on the same wavelength with, <laughs> and that was awesome. So the two people um, that I met for the second or third or whatever times I'd already met them before were Brie from Brie Reads Books. Um, we have met multiple times in the past at previous Worldcon. Um, I've taken trips to see her and everything, and she is one of my favorite human beings. Just having her in the room lights everything up. So I was so happy that she was able to come. She wasn't able to be there for the entire length of the, of the convention because of, um, you know, life changes and stuff like that. But I did get to see her for like three or four days and that was really, really awesome. I also got to meet Denise again. I met her for the first time at the 2016 Worldcon. Um, she does have a, a YouTube channel. I don't know if she's going to be active again. She's been out of it for a while. Um, but I was really looking forward to seeing her there as well because I hadn't talked to her in quite a while. And it was great to catch up a little bit. And then everybody else that I met there um, from Booktube or otherwise was my first time meeting them. So um, I did meet Paul from A Common Touch of Fantasy. He's one of my oldest friends uh, here from Booktube. Um, he, he was, I think, one of the very first people who ever subscribed to my channel too and started commenting. So I've known him for about four years now, so it was high time that we finally met. Um, I also met Joe from Final Blow Joe and Claire from Claire Rousseau, who came over from England, and that was really exciting. Um, I met Thomas from SFF 180 as well, Kelsey from the Fancy Hat Lady Reads. Um, Kelsey, Claire, and Bree and I, we all roomed together, so we spent a lot of time together, and it was a blast. And the other people that I got to meet were John and Bex from Night Hunter Books. Um, I'm a little ashamed to say that I didn't quite know who they were before. I didn't know they were going to be there, but I'd, I had actually seen their channel before. Um, but they showed up, which is really, really pleasant. They're also awesome people, and I got to spend time with them at panels and for meals and stuff, and they were amazing. So I will link all these people down below so you can check out their channels or their online presences if you want to, because they are all amazing and lovely. And then um, there were some other people that I met, uh, people who recognized me and came up and said hello and introduced themselves, and that is so flattering. <laughs> There's always that kind of fear in the background, I think, that um, when you, you meet strangers from your online life that it might be a little bit creepy. So I just want to say to all the people who came up and said hello to me, you were not creepy at all, and I'm, I'm so happy that you came and said hello because it's really nice to be able to put a face to the name or the username. Um, so at this point, I have forgotten some names of people, like, I'm sorry, the, the day started to become a blur, um, but I did get me, get to meet um, Alok and Avakeda. Um, I still don't know if I'm pronouncing your username right, I'm sorry. Um, I got, got to meet Brett, who doesn't comment but watches, and told me some interesting things about CJ Cherry and her books, so thank you for that. Um, who else did I get to meet? Oh my goodness. Oh, Kaylee! Kaylee also came up and said hello to me, and that was awesome. Um, and I am recognized by some famous people as well, which, um, yeah. So one, Ada Palmer knows who I am, and I think she's actually watched some of my videos, and yeah. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Ada Palmer, like, as a writer, but also as a person. Uh, so that was interesting. She gave me a ribbon. Um, and probably the best single moment of the entire convention was when Taiyo Fuji recognized me and was like calling my name and then gave me a big hug and we like just like freaked out over each other. Um, I still don't know what to say. So there's no like video evidence of this happening but everybody was like really, really into it. It was a moment guys. Um, I'm still, I still can't quite believe that that happened, um, but uh, we did get a picture taken together, so I will try to put that up here somewhere. Um, so yes, that was like, I, I don't really have words for that one. <laughs> the other really exciting thing that happened at Worldcon this year was right after the Hugo Awards ceremony, um, Kelsey and I were going back to our room and then Brie was already home and she started blowing up my phone like, Rachel, Rachel, you need to pay attention, read your messages, because I made it to the long list in the best fan cast category. Like, <laughs> um, 
I'm not even sure how that happened, but apparently enough of you guys nominated me in Best Fan Cast, so yeah, um, thank you. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not the first YouTube channel to make the long list, um, I think there was one shortlisted a year or two ago, but my channel is the first booktube channel to make the long list, so that was, I was not expecting that, um, and a lot, it was really weird because like a couple of hours prior to learning that, I was in this really in-depth conversation with people, including Thomas from SFF 180, where I was like trying to lay out this argument for why Thomas was going to be the first booktuber to ever crack the long list, and like I'm still convinced it should have probably been him, um, but I'll I'll take it. So yeah, um, th thank you to everybody. That's that's pretty amazing. I never had any idea that my little informal hobby would ever ever make it to you know tangentially Hugo related in any way. So um, that makes me very happy. So some other things that I did at the convention that are probably worth uh, noting. I did go to programming. I didn't go to nearly as many panels or, or the things that were scheduled as I kind of thought I was going to, mainly for good reasons, because I was off, you know, doing things with friends or whatever. Um, but I have to say there were some real, like, logistical issues with the convention this year. Um, the convention center apparently has a good reputation for accessibility and everything, but the places or the rooms in which many of the panels and events were scheduled in were way too small, and it caused a lot of issues. I'm a little appalled also at the way that some people were behaving. Um, people were like taking reserved seats when they weren't supposed to. They were, I saw people like using up the accessibility spaces in rooms, like filling them with chairs instead of letting people with, you know, the mobility scooters come in. Um, and then people were just doing rude things like constantly going in and out of panels and readings and stuff well into the time allotted. It's like, I was in Joe Walton's uh, reading, which was only 30 minutes long, and people were opening and closing the door and trying to squeeze in or get out every minute from beginning to end. I was like, come on, people. Um, that And that kept happening. It happened in, a, in another reading I was in, and it also happened in some panels and stuff. Um, and part of the reason why it was so aggravating is that the rooms were way too small, and that made going to some of these things really unpleasant because people were packed into the rooms like sardines. I'm pretty sure they were violating the um, capacity uh, of the rooms and everything, and it was not fun. Um, so I'm, I'm griping about that a little bit because I didn't get to go to some things I really wanted to because I couldn't take being squeezed into rooms with no airflow and not being able to hear people properly because they weren't given microphones. Um, so yeah, I only went to two readings even though that was um, mainly what I wanted to go to. I had tons of readings on my, my schedule, my little program, and I only went to two even though I had like 10 times that many marked on my schedule. They were all all the readings were in one room, and being in that room was pretty awful. Um, so that makes me sad. But I did get to see Jo Walton, I did get to hear her read from her next book, which is Lent. It's coming out in April or May in 2019, I think. I was really happy about that because I need her next book. <laughs> I did go to some panels, and I went to one talk. Probably one of my favorite things that I went to was the really weird science quantum computing talk that Kevin Roach did, and that was basically about um, what is quantum computing and what IBM is doing, because uh, Roach works for IBM. And that was like hands down one of the most educational and interesting things I attended at all. It was just, you know, him presenting on it. He was a really great speaker, and the whole concept was explained really well. It was very um, easy to understand. He like avoided all the math. So that was a lot of fun, actually. Um, I also went to 
an anthology creation panel. Um, Jonathan Strong was supposed to be on. I was really looking forward to seeing him, but he didn't make it. He was um, scheduled for something else at the same time. But Ellen Dallow was on that panel, and John Joseph Adams from Lightspeed, and a couple of other people as well. And just hearing them talk about the process, the art, of, of coming up with an anthology theme, um, getting stories for it, dealing with reprints versus original stories and everything, and then how they actually assemble the stories, how they put them in a certain order and everything. That was really interesting. It, it actually answered some questions that I've had in the back of my head for a while while I'm reading anthologies about why they were put together or why certain stories were selected and stuff. So that was also a really educational one and Ellen Datlow is amazing. <laughs> I also ended up squeezed into an elevator with Ellen Datlow and Pat Cadigan at one point, and I did keep my cool, but I was like the entire elevator ride just thinking, oh my god, I'm in the same elevator as Ellen freaking Datlow and Pat Cadigan. <laughs> um, some other things that I went to, probably the other one that's really, really worth mentioning is the Mexican Female Horror Writers panel. Is that not actually the name of it, but it was a panel of um, Mexican women who wrote um, horror, who were talking about the, you know, the history of women writing horror in, in Mexico and their recommendations and everything, and it was fascinating. I'm not into horror. I mean, I will read some creepy stories um, that aren't like full-blown horror, but it was just, I think, the history and what all of those women had to say about their personal relationship with horror and that connection to you know, their lives and, and, and the history of Mexico and living there and everything. That was amazing. And I have, I wrote down so many things that I wanted to check out um, from that panel, a lot of the women that they mentioned. And the good thing is that a lot of these stories, the individual stories they mentioned rather than books, um, are translated and printed in, in English in the Three Messages and a Warning um, anthology that I got from Small Beer Press a little while ago. So I'm so glad I have that. I have so much more context for what that anthology is for, and I'm really excited about reading it now. Oh no, wait, according to my notes, I also went to the Celebrating the YA Award panel, which had Sam J. Miller, Sarah Reese Brennan, Ursula Vernon and somebody else, I can't remember their name, on the panel. And I love that one mainly because it was the only time I got to see Ursula Vernon and she was hilarious and at a certain point I was laughing so hard I was finding it difficult to breathe. So anything that hilarious, yeah, it was really memorable. <laughs> I, I adore Ursula Vernon. I love her writing both under her real name and under her T. King Fisher name and she's also just a really funny person and a great human being, so that was also really awesome. Before I move on to um, some of the outside excursions and then things that I got in the dealer's room, I want to show my badge. Um, when you go to Worldcon, you get your member's badge. Um, I have a Space Unicorn Ranger Core um, sticker that I got from Lynn M. Thomas when she was on, I think it was the it was a library's panel. Um, I have a she, her pronoun sticker, which Brie gave me. She brought a bunch of pronoun stickers and people really love them. I really hope that the convention eventually like starts handing them out themselves at registration because so many people wanted them. Um, and then I have ribbons. Ribbons, I think, might be more important at Worldcon than any other convention. It's, it's kind of a Worldcon tradition. I didn't actively go out and try to get them this year, but I still got some. Um, so I have the DC in 2021 site bid uh, ribbon. I got site selection voter because I voted for the next site, which was New Zealand, and yes, they won their bid. Not surprising because they were um, not competing with anybody else. Um, I got Lightspeed uh, magazine ribbon from John Joseph Adams on the anthology curation panel. Um, Dublin 2019, I picked that up from um, their booth. Uh, that's going to be next year. <laughs> yes, I am going. Um, and then I got the To Boldly Go uh, There and Back Again, which is um, another ribbon for New Zealand. And then while I was sitting at a panel, I found out that Ada Palmer was sitting in front of me, and I didn't recognize her from the back at first. I was listening to somebody else talk to me, and then she turned around while I was talking about her books and like said hello, and <laughs> I freaked out. I was a little embarrassed, um, but it's all good. She gave me the Antarctica 2454 ribbon, which is a, a reference to um, The Will to Battle, the third book in her series. So there's that. 
Um, and then I, when I was at registration, I did pick up one of the official t-shirts. This is my favorite one, the kind of um, reddish one. They're, they had another one there which had the artwork from um, the 76th World Con's official logo and stuff, and I'm not really fond of that, but I was really glad they had this one. It's a little bit more generic, but it's totally my color. <laughs> um, the last things that I want to go over are some of the things that I did outside of the convention, and then things that I bought in the dealer's room that were not books, because like I said, that's gonna be a separate video because there are so many of them. Um, but on the first full day that, um, I was there with Paul and Joe. We went to the Tech Museum, which was only a couple of blocks away from our hotel. Um, I forget the full name of it, but it's, it's the Tech Museum there. We only had about two hours to be there, so we didn't get involved in a lot of the little exhibits and interactive things, um, but we did spend most of our time in the second floor in the Body Worlds exhibit, which was interesting. So you may have heard of Body Worlds, I think it's about 15 years old. There are multiple exhibits, um, but it's basically um, plasticized human bodies. And the whole thing shows you like human anatomy and how the human body works and everything. And the first time I ever heard about um, body worlds, it was still really controversial. People have issues with it because, you know, it's real human bodies and you know, people donate their bodies, they definitely give permission, but it it bothers some people. And I understand why now that I've actually been there. When you walk into the exhibit, there are actual warning signs that say you might, might find this disturbing if you need to leave, locate an exit. Um, I didn't have a problem, I didn't see anybody else have a problem when I was there, but there were some things that I didn't look at too closely. Um, like, sure, I looked at the penises, but I did not look at the intestines for some reason. I just I couldn't take that one. Um, so yeah, um, it, that was interesting. I'm glad, I'm glad that I finally got to go see it. Um, but at some level, I think it's going to be uncomfortable for a lot of people, especially it's going to make you think about your own relationship to your body and what's inside your body. When you like see a human being flayed with all of their muscles showing and stuff. And yeah, I'm a little bit of a hypochondriac, so I had to be careful with that one, but it was really worth going to. Um, and then the day after that, when Brie arrived, we went to the Winchester house and we took a tour of it. And I got a couple of things there. At the Winchester house, I got a little magnet. This was my favorite one. They had a bunch of them there, but this is the shiny kind of gold one. <laughs> um, and I got some of the postcards because I really liked the artwork on them. So that's one. And then this is um, the same art that's used on the magnet. And then I got a sticker. Don't know what I'm gonna do with this. One of these postcards is gonna go to my friend Elmo because she was like, Rachel, you're gonna be in San Jose. You have to go see the Winchester house. I did, Elmo, I did. Um, <laughs> and now we move on to the stuff that I got at the dealer's room and one thing that I got from the art show that I can show you now. So basically, I showed up at the convention with money burning a hole in my pocket, and I had some things that I knew I wanted to do because I didn't do them the previous time. Um, I wanted to go to the art show, I wanted to go to the masquerade, and I really wanted to buy myself some nice jewelry. I didn't end up going to the masquerade. Um, something else came up that night. It was another evening thing, and I think I was just so tired at that point that I, I decided to go back to our hotel room. But um, I did buy jewelry, and I did go to the art show. So there's kind of a saga of this because I kept acquiring things. It was like a snowball effect where I did one thing which meant that another thing happened, which meant that another thing happened, and I have no regrets. I made so many good decisions. So the first thing that I got in the dealer's room, I saw this the first day and I went back the next day to get it. Um, the Hibernacula booth was there. So I saw this um, antler necklace the first time. And I got it. This is the one that I wore to the Hugo Awards ceremony, and I loved it. I just I love the simplicity. It's it's really really beautiful. Um, so let me find the business card here. You can see this is the Hibernacula um, business card. I will be buying more things from this creator in the future. She was really lovely at the booth. <laughs> 
um, and I just I loved the style of what she was creating. Um, so after that, I went to the art show. Um, I wanted to take one of the tours they were doing because they had some people going through and like leading groups and talking about the different booths and exhibits and stuff. So I and Paul and Joe and I think Kelsey and Brie showed up eventually too. We, we went to that, but we ended up ditching the tour because we couldn't hear them talking and there was a a lot of people, it was difficult to see anything. So we just went off on our own and it was great. I mean, if you're gonna go to a world con, definitely go to the art show because they have amazing stuff in there. And I think almost everything in the art show is for sale. So you can register to bid and then bid on items. And if you have the highest bid, you get it. Um, if there are too many bids, it goes to an auction. You can try to get it there. So. I fell in love with a bunch of stuff, but we got near the end of the art show and they had a bunch of like the sculptures and the 3D stuff laid out on tables. And there was this red dragon there. Um, I, I wish I could show it to you, but there was no photography allowed in the art show, of course. And as you could probably tell, I didn't get it, but I fell so hard for it. Um, I, I, I bid on it and I went back the next day to bid on it again because I wanted it so much. But it was becoming clear that I wasn't going to be able to, you know, match the bids. So I went off and I bid on another item at the art show, which was a silk evening wrap. It was really beautiful, like hand embroidered with beadwork and everything. Um, then, <laughs> the next day when I came back, um, I lost out on both of them and I was really sad. Um, <laughs> so I did get a print of something there, actually. I should mention that. Um, this is by Natalie, yeah, Natalie Metzger. Um, her website is fuzzyslugstudios.com. She had a bunch of pieces in the art show that were kind of like this. They're basically like a modern animal or amphibian or something inside of the skull of an extinct um, animal. So this one is a giant squid inside of the skull of a triceratops. The one that everybody adored so much was the penguins inside of a saber-toothed tiger skull, I think. Um, all the prints of that were sold out, so I didn't get it. But I did get this one. I, I really love this one. It will probably end up in my bedroom. And I think I might go to her online store and get um, the one that um, was sold out. So, um, like I said, I went back eventually and discovered that I hadn't gotten either of the items I bid on. One went to somebody else and then the other, the, the evening wrap, went to auction and I was not going to deal with the auction. That was too stressful. So, um, to console myself for losing out on the things that I really wanted, I went back to the dealer's hall to get more jewelry. <laughs> so I splurged. Um, I went to the... Lillian Todaro uh, booth. She had mainly just amazing beaded jewelry. I think that's her thing is kind of um, sculpted beaded jewelry. It's amazing. A lot of it I wouldn't wear. It's too big and chunky for me, but the technique is amazing. I love the way that beaded jewelry looks and I especially love the way that it feels and especially when it's like a, like almost like a fabric made out of beads. Um, it's, it's a textural experience guys. I really like it. So we, I went back to her booth. I ended up getting something that wasn't one of her beaded pieces but it was the most unique item there and then I discovered that um, it's basically one of a kind and there will never be another one like it. So it is this. Um, I've taken close-up pictures that I will put in here if you can't see it very well here, but it's really cool. Um, it's like a, a swirl pendant with a lot of different colors in there. Um, and I wanted to get earrings that matched, so she had um, amber earrings that match the amber used in the pendant. So I am, I am very happy with my choices. <laughs> Um, it's probably the coolest, fanciest jewelry that I own now, and I'm going to have to upgrade my wardrobe so that I have something decent to uh, wear while I'm wearing this pendant. But yeah, it's it's beautiful. I would love to have more of her jewelry, especially some of the beaded bracelets. So um, I will leave the link to her website down below as well. And uh, it doesn't stop there because um, then, after the Hugo Awards ceremony, I, d I discovered I was on the long list for the best fan cast category, and I was up really late that night, I couldn't sleep, and I kept thinking about this other necklace that I saw at the Hibernacula booth, 
and I had to leave the next day. I was gonna be leaving to go to the airport at 10, which is the time that the um, dealer's hall opens up, but I wanted this so much that everybody, everybody waited for me while I ran back <laughs> to um, get it, and it was still there. So this is a Tree of Life uh, pendant. I'm pretty sure that the creator told me it was inspired by imagery from um, the Divine Comedy, which makes sense. Um, so it looks like this. And once again, I'll try to put some more up-close pictures in here so you can see it better. Um, it's really, really detailed, but when you see it from a distance, it's just kind of like a blob. <laughs> So this is one that I bought for myself. I'm probably one of the few people who ever see it, you know, close up enough to see the details, but I adore it. And it's not a solid piece, which is what I originally thought. It is multiple bits held together by wire work, and I am, I am so impressed. <laughs> that must have taken ages to do. So, yes. Um, so that's, you know, all the stuff that I got. I mean, I wanted it. I was going to probably get it anyway, but um, a lot of the stuff, I just kept going back because I lost things at the, at the art show. But it doesn't end there because um, I left the convention. I had just landed from my the first leg of my flight home in Denver, and I got this voicemail from somebody at the convention who was like, um, we are, you know, shutting down the convention. We are dismantling the art show. You need to come pick up your item. And I was like, I didn't get anything. <laughs> Except I did. I have no idea um, how it happened at all, uh, but I ended up getting the um, Silk Evening wrap that had gone to auction. It went to auction, but it reverted to me for some reason. So I did get it. I don't have it here with me to show you because it's in the mail right now. Um, like I said, I was in Denver when I found out about it. So I ended up calling friends back at the convention being like, are you still there? Can you go get this? Because I only have an hour to arrange for payment and getting it and everything. So Claire ended up running right over and she got it and she paid for it for me and she she took some pictures of it and then sent it to me via, via UPS. So I have some pictures to show you. Um, I will definitely show it in a video in the future when it arrives, which should be in a couple of days because it's so cool. I think it's even better in person. And yeah, I'm gonna wear it. I'm probably gonna wear it. <laughs> so that made me so happy. Just things kept happening like every single day and it was all awesome. This has been a very rambly video. I could talk about so many other things like all the other things that I did and experiences I had and all the food I ate because there were excellent restaurants in the area and we went to like a new place every day and it was really cool. I had Ethiopian food for the first time. I had Malaysian food for the first time. We went to a lovely little Indian place. It was like eating comfort food. Um, we had we went to like a Persian bakery cafe which had amazing cakes. I did get opera cake which was really really good um, and I had it for breakfast. No regrets. So yeah it was just like so many things happened. It was so cool. And I'm home now and it feels like real life is just bland and gray and nothing exciting will happen again until the next Worldcon. <laughs> so um, I think I will end there and then get on to filming my book haul, which is what a lot of you probably care about. Um, so thank you for listening to all of my Worldcon rambles. I will be in Dublin in 2019 for the next Worldcon, barring any horrific things happening in my life that might prevent me from doing it. I'm going to be there. I've begun the process of applying for my passport. I've already asked about exchanging currency at my bank. I'm ready. I'm so ready to do this again. So maybe I will see you next year in Dublin. Let me know if you think you're going to go. Um, and if you went to Worldcon, let me know what your experience was and what you enjoyed doing. So with that, I will talk to you again soon.